be amazed, you will be astonished, you will be surprised. First of all, by the futurist, by the visionary, by the consultant to disruptive change. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Dietmar Dahmen. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're awake. If not, have a coffee. Let's see if there's a picture of a coffee behind me. Yes, excellent. Uh, I'm not going to talk about coffee. I'm actually going to talk about insects, right? If you take a bee, and it's a really good bee, and you put a bee like this into a bottle like that, and the bee's in the bottle, and you go to your garden window, and you put the bottle against the garden window, the bee wants to get out of that bottle. So it's a worker bee. What does the bee do? It sees there's freedom. It flies towards freedom. But it doesn't get there because the bottle ends here. So it, as again, it puts more power into flying towards the freedom. It concentrates. It goes, bam, bam. I have to get out of this bottle. And it flies and flies and flies until it's dead. The bee will die in this bottle. If you take the fly into the bottle like this, the fly tries to fly out of the bottle. It doesn't get there. So what does it do? It says, hey, this doesn't work. I'm going to fly somewhere else. And it flies somewhere else, and it's out in four minutes. The huge difference between the bee and the fly is that the bee does not accept change. The bee thinks I've always been flying this way. That's where I want to go. That's where I need to go. Whereas the fly totally accepts change. The fly says, I'm not going there anymore. I need to find new ways to get to my goal. So let's talk about change for a while. If we look at change, it looks to us rather chaotic. It's confusing. And we tend to see the danger in this picture. But if you wait a while, you will see that there's structure in all that change. And in fact, the change like this robot saves your life. Change is really, really good for you. It saves your lives and it can help you win stuff, right? And it does so fast. And our development, if you walk around Sabin and stuff like that, if you were here last year and you're here now, the change is ultra fast. The development runs. You might know the speed of knowledge doubling. The knowledge doubling curve, which was introduced by Bucky Fuller, uh, in the 70s stated that up until the year 1900, the knowledge that was available to mankind doubled approximately every 100 years. In 1925, it already doubled every 25 years. Today, it doubles every 13 months. And by 2020, with the internet of everything advancing like crazy, the knowledge that will be available to you in terms of quantity, is there parking or is there not parking? Is a kid on the swing or not? Is my window at home open or not? Will double what, every 13 days? No, every 12 hours. Every 12 hours, our knowledge will double. This speed is neck breaking. So you have to understand what is running. If development is running, what is running? I show you what running is. This is running. Bam, bam, bam. Running is both feet off the ground. This is walking. One foot on the ground, one foot on the ground, one foot on the ground. Running is both feet off the ground, and that's a moment where we don't know what is happening. Let's look at technology running, right? That's a moment where nobody knew what was happening. That was the invention of the telephone. When the phone was invented, nobody knew what to do with it. The Queen of England was, in fact, one of the first people on the planet to get a phone. She didn't know what to do with it. So what did she do? You might know she connected her phone to the opera. And then she was listening to the people sing in the opera. She was streaming music. That's what she did. Then the foot, first foot landed. We were more comfortable with the curve, and we invented the desktop phone. So the phone was on the desktop. You could actually use it. Then it became a laptop, so you can talk like this. And then it became mobile, and everybody was happy. Both feet on the ground. I understand where I am. And then development ran. Again, bam, tuck, and somebody invents the mobile phone. You might remember when the mobile phone was invented, nobody knew what to do with it. The world was actually thinking that maybe 4,000, maybe 5,000 people on the planet would use a mobile phone. But as you know, everybody has a mobile phone, everybody was happy, both feet on the ground. And then again, development ran. Bam, another jump, and the smartphone was invented. And when the smartphone was invented again, nobody knew what to do with it. Why should we have a smartphone? The smartphone existed before the App Store existed. 
And then and now everybody has a smartphone. So the interesting thing here is not only that each new curve comes with a both feet off the ground moment where we don't know what to do with this curve. The interesting thing is also that each curve is dominated by a different player. If you look at landline telephones, they are dominated by player number one. We're currently in Germany, so I think Germany was dominated like Siemens was dominating this curve. And then the mobile phone was dominated by player number two, let's say Nokia. And then the smartphone was dominated by player number three, let's say Apple or Samsung. Neither Nokia nor Siemens. So what that means is that the companies could not do the jump. They saw the technology, they had 80% market share, whatever, but they could not do the jump to the new technology. They had everything and they lost everything. Why? Because they thought, never change a winning horse. We're number one. We really know mobile telephones. Why should we go into smartphones? It makes no sense. It will go away. Never change a winning horse. But let's look at why this George horse is winning, right? App, uh, obviously, it's a very strong horse. Tons of muscle, really good coordination. That's your company. You have excellent machines like the muscle, and it's really, really well trained. And on top of the horse is an excellent jockey. That's your sea level management, right? Your top management sitting there steering the horse, and it's an awesome team. It's good leadership. It knows where it's to want to go, and has the power to actually go there. But then in this picture, there's all this green stuff, all this stuff around the horse. And that's where the horse is operating. That's the environment the horse is operating in. And if you keep the horse exactly like it is, and if you keep the jockey exactly as it is right now, and the only thing you change is the environment, all of a sudden the horse will not perform that good anymore. If you put the horse in the ocean, it's not good. And because in the ocean you have new winners, all of a sudden you have new animals, dolphins, slowest animal on land. No animal is slower than a dolphin. What kind of an animal is it? It talks like an old internet modem, you know? It's not a winning thing, but in the new liquid environment, the new species completely outperforms the old one. And if you have new winners, by definition, you have new losers, and the attack is rather brutal. So let's look about businesses and winning and losing. We all know certain rules that apply if we want to be good in business, right? You have to have excellent products, and you have to have a good marketing strategy, and you have to have a nice pricing and awesome distribution, and all those things. And let's say all those things are aces. Distribution, product, price, marketing, all those things are aces. And you hold all those four aces in your hand. And then you say, nothing can happen. What could happen to me? I win. Look, I have four aces. And then I pull out a gun. And I say, who wins now? And then you say, well, you can't do that. That's illegal. And I said, yeah, but look, I'm doing it. Well, I don't know. Uh, it's not written in the book. I said, yeah, but think about it. Think about who wins now. Cluck. And we all know that one Smith & Wesson beats four aces. It's illegal, you must not do that, it's not fair, but that is what is happening. So let's look at the record industry. The record industry was awesome. It had the perfect product, awesome distribution, super marketing, really good pricing and stuff like that. But then somebody pulled a gun. Napster came and they pulled a gun and it was illegal. The kids went to jail, the police came, pushed in the doors, took the service and threw the kids in jail, but the gun was out. The gun was there, and the record industry was frightened. And then iTunes pulled out the gun and made it legal. And all of a sudden, there was a new concept. The new game was that you basically pay not for an album, but per song, and that all songs are 99 cents. That's completely new. And iTunes said, yeah, I'm running the world. What can happen to me? And all of a sudden, Spotify comes and pulls out a gun and says, you know what, why own a song? I don't sell the song, I sell access to the song. That's totally illegal. How can you do that? That's not in the book. That's not fair. It's a gun. But people are doing it. So let's look at this fact. There are three observations. Observation number one, the market for the single solution is unstable. That basically means the records die, iTunes dies, Spotify will die. But the market for the basic need is stable. 
So the market for the need, for instance, of listening to music is stable. Or if you look at a thing that, or a development that happened 100 years ago, it was the need to keep food fresh. The need to keep fruit fresh is stable. How did they keep food fresh? In the beginning, they had cans. You put everything in a can. You had peas or fish, you put it in a can. Then in the 1920s, you had block ice. The cans were going down, that's why Cannery Wharf and stuff like that has no more canneries, but clubs. Cans went down and people delivered block ice. And then in the 1950s, block ice went away and people started to use the electric refrigerator. So again, the single solutions die. You don't have block ice at home, but you have an electric refrigerator. And the need stays. So that is observation number one. Observation number two is that the solutions get more simple for the user. Let's go back to the can example again. If you have a can, the user needs to have a can opener to open the can. And I don't know if you've been camping or stuff like that, you might remember those moments where you have a can and you go, oh shit, you know, I don't have an opener. So the opener is dying because with block ice, you don't need a can opener. With block ice, you just need block ice. You can just get out the, the fruit immediately from the fridge. It's, it's a door, you just open it like this. But with block ice, you have to be at home on certain days when they deliver it, the ice melts, you have to take care of water and stuff like that. So block ice is, is more inconvenient than, for instance, a, a plug where you just plug it in. So the rule is simple wins. The simpler the solution, the more the users will like it. Simplicity wins. Why use an electric, uh, why use a can opener when you have an electric plug in the end? However, if you look around here, you will see that the world gets more and more complex. So how can I say simple wins and the world gets more complex? Well, the trick is that the solutions get more complex for the supplier, for the people who do it. Everybody can do a can. There's even an article on how to make a can at home. All you need to do is bend the metal. It's easy to make a can. For the supplier, very, very easy. Block ice for the supplier, a little bit more complicated. You actually have to have three stages of freezing it and stuff like that. You need a factory, it's a little bit more complicated. Electric refrigerator, even more complicated. And if you now connect the electric refrigerator to the internet and the electric refrigerator notices when your milk is out and automatically orders it, it's very complicated for you, the supplier. But it's very easy for the user. I don't even have to order milk anymore. So the easier for the, for the user it gets, the harder it gets for the supplier. That's the next rule. And then the final rule is that the solutions move from silos to ecosystems. What does that mean, right? Look at the record. The record is a silo. I can only listen to it on my record player. And I can't share it. I can't do anything with it. It's a silo medium. Look at Spotify. Spotify is an ecosystem. You can share it. You have festival playlists. You have everything. It's a total ecosystem. I'm from Austria and there's Red Bull. That's a silo, but Red Bull operates in the ecosystem of adrenaline. They have people jump off the space because it's the ecosystem of adrenaline. Look at Apple, for instance. It's an ecosystem. The new iWatch won't even work without an iPhone. It's not a silo solution at all. Nike is an ecosystem, and obviously SAP is an ecosystem. Look at Hybris. Look at what Hybrid does. It's compete. It connects to everybody. So ecosystems are really, really big. Those trends are happening. The nice. trends... Progress is not how smart you are. If you take five Nobel Prize winners in a room and you give, don't give them any outside access and they have kids for five generations, you have inbred idiots. So code is not how smart you are, but how connected you are. And we are hyper-connected. We connect to our people. So she says, how do you like it? Oh, I like it really well. We connect to machines. Hey, uh, I want to buy this ticket for that thing. The machine connects back to us. Hey, the waiting line is now only 10 minutes. Come down when you're there. We look at our phone 150 times a day. We're the most distracted society of all time. That's why there are notices like this, right? In case of fire, exit the building before tweeting about it but we fear change. We don't like to learn. And if we learn, we only do it by copying, because copying makes us very, very happy, because we have mirror neurons, and mirror neurons tell us, copy what you see. 
copy what you see and it's really, really good. That's what mirror neurons are, right? But if you're in business and you copy, it's no good. Managers tend to replicate best practice, I know. Managers follow the rules, this is what I should do. But leaders, leaders look for big new ideas. And leaders break the rules. And leaders make their own rules. Because leaders pull out a gun and say, who is winning now?